Beloved, we're speaking tonight on this Father's Day Sunday in America. From the book of Ephesians to what I consider to be the greatest prayer in the New Testament. Now I'm taking issue with those who say, well, the Lord's Prayer is a great. Well, I would agree, but I'm talking about from men or a man who knew the Lord, who knew what it was to be lost so far away from God, even though he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and a Hebrew of the Hebrews, by his own testimony said, as concerning the law, I was blameless. But he said, all those things that I once depended upon, as one translator puts it, and thought were so worthwhile I count them all lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Amen. And it's this man's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 that caught my attention some years ago before I was preaching my, my trial sermon, if you please, at Oakdale Baptist Church in Mobile, Alabama. Now the year was the year that America was going through some of the same turmoil that it is tonight. We were in racial unrest. People in St. Louis where I was pastoring when I went to Mobile to preach this sermon was in turmoil. People were moving to the county, trying to move away from the areas where they were living because there was so much turmoil over racial tension. And our black brothers and sisters were uh, trying their best to keep their people from losing their, their cool, so to speak. And my people, many of them were driving 45 minutes to an hour, catching streetcars and buses to get to the church where I was pastor at Water Tower Baptist Church in St. Louis. And people would come up to me and say, Pastor, you're not leaving us, are you? As long as you're our pastor, we're going to keep coming to this church. Now, boy, that'll put pressure on you. Because I felt like the Lord may be leaving me, leading me to leave that church and go to Mobile, Alabama. And everybody said, you don't want to go down there. You know what's going on in Mobile, Alabama? Man, oh man. Have you watched the news? You know, they didn't give me every reason in the world, they thought, that I should uh, stay right where I was, even though we were going through a lot of turmoil in our city. And I was in a struggle praying about what God wanted me to do. And I went to Mobile and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to hit this thing head on. And I stood up in the pulpit and I said, Beloved, I'm going to preach this morning a message that God's given me to preach to this church. And now whether you call me as pastor or not, that's between you and the Lord. But I'm going to be obedient to share with you from this passage of Scripture the message that's on my heart. And I turn to this Scripture. This was my trial sermon, Russell. This is it. This is it. And I want it, I want it to be uh, preserved, if you please, on, on YouTube with all my other messages because we're in a series on Ephesians. And I want this message for all the sake of my old friends who were teenagers, like some of these that are coming in to have their camp this week in our church. And I saw all these young people come in and I said, Lord, that's where I'd like to be. That's my heart. You know how much I love the young people when I was pastor and how much I would love to speak to some of these young people in our church. But the Lord saw fit to move me from the young people to the senior saints at Christ Fellowship. And that's quite a switch, whether you realize it or not. Quite a switch for me in my explanation and application and exhortation whatever you want to call it, and trying to magnify Jesus 
and help people to understand the privilege we have as new creatures in Christ, as members of the family of God, as we sang a moment ago, that the, the privilege, the priceless privilege, one translator put it, the priceless privilege of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now with those introductory words, I want to ask you to turn with me in the New Living Translation. If you have a, an iPad or an iPhone or whatever, pull up your Bible app. I hope you have one. If you don't, you need to get one. <laughs> and uh, whatever app you may have or whatever Bible you have with you, uh, I know that a lot of us don't have the New, Li the New Living Translation. But for the sake of these messages we've been preaching, I've been using, not the NIV, but the NLT. NLT, New Living Translation, all right? Now I want to begin reading tonight where Paul concludes in the 10th verse of chapter 3. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You see, whether you realize it or not, our message and our testimony, Russell, when the angels in heaven hear you speak at these meetings where you're going, they're learning for themselves the mystery of Christianity. They don't know anything about being saved on planet Earth. Now think about that. Do you realize what you've been reading all these years in the King James? That the rulers above in heaven, the places, that we're helping them, those authorities in the heavenlies, to understand that this is God's eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now remember, he's talking to New Testament believers, to people who've been saved and born again and brought into the family of God through the precious blood of Jesus. The cleansing power, the converting power to change their lives, to make them more and more like Jesus every day. You know, that's God's plan. I want to ask you this question again. I think some days ago I asked some of you, are you more like Jesus today than you were yesterday? That old hymn that I brought to your attention some weeks ago, more like the master I would ever be, more of his meekness, more humility, more zeal to labor, more courage to be true, more consecration for work he bids me do. Are we more consecrated to the work that he has called us to do? To the Great Commission, if you please, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature as we're trying to do tonight through this little group here at Christ Fellowship? You know, I was very humble when our pastor said, you get nothing but support from me if you go on YouTube. He said, I'm thrilled to hear about it. Now, I mentioned that to know in case any of the staff is listening, that we're here with the total support of our pastor, the senior pastor of this fellowship, because he believes in what we're doing and seeking to share the good news of Jesus. And let's go on and read in this third chapter now these glorious words. Because of Christ and our faith in him, verse 12, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Have you done that today? When you pray, do you come boldly and confidently? You say, we don't have any right to, oh yeah, we come humbly, but we also come boldly. Now that may sound like a contradiction to some folks. You know, when I ask God to open the doors for me to go to a certain place or to do a certain thing that I feel led of the Holy Spirit to do, I expect Him to be there when I get there. I expect His power and presence to prevail, to pervade that place, to invade every heart and every mind, 
and to do the work that he wants them to do. You know, I'm like Dwight L. Moody used to say, when I preach the gospel and I give the invitation, I expect people to respond. I expect to see people come to Jesus. And I saw some of the preachers who were present in the meeting where I heard him say that one day in a pastor's conference at the Southern Baptist Convention. It was quoting Dwight L. Moody and I saw some of them kind of look at each other like, well, you know, he's, read, he's been reading my mail. You know, sometimes preachers, uh, they're like uh, the, the writer of Hebrews said, their knees knocking one against the other, you know, uh, in fear because of persecution and the pressures that are put on us every day. You know, one fellow said to me one day, man, if I preach like you preach, I don't know how long I'd be the pastor. I said, well, you must be in a backslidden church. We were talking before the service tonight, some of us, about the word backsliding in the Old Testament. You know, God said, my people, his people, Israel, have gone away backsliding. Now, when I was a boy, I was once, believe it or not, I hear preachers talking about people being in a backslidden condition. You know, I thought, I wonder where they got that. I wondered to myself as a young preacher, is that really a biblical term? So one day I looked it up. I got my lexicon, my Greek lexicon out, and I looked up the word backsliding. And man, I tell you what, I said, those guys have been preaching the truth. You know why, you know why Israel forfeited so much of the blessing, or the blessings, plural, I should say, that God wanted to give them over the Jordan and the Promised Land because they didn't obey God. They forfeited the blessing. Can you imagine that only two men made it from Egypt that were in the original group when they went into Canaan? Over 20 years of age. Now let me finish it. You check me out biblically. Only two men, Joshua and Caleb. And they were so excited in their old age, they said, let's go up at once and possess the land. You know, that's the way I feel. I'm 87 years old. I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm more excited about the Lord and what he's doing in my life than I've ever been. You know, every time I look at the YouTube and see how many viewers we had on last Sunday night sermon or two weeks ago or a year ago when we first started our work two years ago, almost, right? Since we started the work and Daniel felt led of the Lord to buy the equipment and come out here and said, Preacher, we've got to get you on the internet. I said, oh man, we can't do that. He said, we sure can. Man, he didn't have any doubt. He came boldly. He said, I'll come here and set it up. I'll buy the equipment. He said, you don't have to worry about a thing. And you know what? He, he made a commitment, but he said, I'll be there every Sunday night. Every Sunday night. Do you know what? You haven't missed one, have you? Hasn't missed a Sunday. Now, that's pretty good for a Jewish boy <laughs> that found Jesus. That's his testimony. And Paul, so excited here, he said, but, now let me go back to that verse again, verse 12. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. The very presence of God. So please don't lose heart because of my trials here. He meant in prison. I'm writing to you from prison. But don't lose heart because of what I'm suffering. So you don't, don't throw in the towel and say, well, if Paul is faithful as he's been in preaching, you know, what, what chance do I have if, if God's not going to see Paul through to the end of his ministry? Why should I take a chance? Well, boy, I tell you, that's why Russell and I, he's always talking about the Apostle Paul. He gets turned on every time he reads something about the Apostle Paul. Now, you know, you know uh, the other night I was sharing with Russ. Paul said in his testimony of sinners, I was chief, the chief sinner. He also goes on to say when he writes a young preacher of the New Testament, when God saved me, 
he showed just what he could do. He was saying in so many words in our language, if he can save a sinner like me, he can save anybody. Amen. We sang Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, it's until people come to that place where they realize how wretched we are, you know. Step one in the recovery. I'm helpless without it. It's utterly impossible for me to break this habit, to live for him, to be what I ought to be, to overcome this habit, this hang-up, this addiction, whatever it is. Without him, the old song says, I can do nothing. Isaiah, I want to say, you played that, you know that song, that song. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I'd surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Listen to the chorus. Jesus. See who gets the credit? Oh, Jesus. Do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Now, I won't sing the rest of it. But, you know, I think sometimes we just stand up and sing it because the worship leader says, in a lot of churches, we're still singing that song without him. I remember when the song came out. I remember I was in a revival in St. Louis. And the man who was leading the music, who went into the ministry after that, who's preached as an evangelist in this church when the former pastor was here, in a one-day revival, was in that meeting. And we saw a man come down the aisle when he sang that song for the invitation. Doris, as long as I live, my wife was there. I'll never, ever forget it. We had driven from Mobile all the way to St. Louis to be in that church. On the closing Sunday of an eight-day meeting, I saw a bus driver come down that aisle, whose wife had been praying for him for years and years to come to know Jesus. And the whole church began to weep. I looked around, I saw everybody weeping. I thought, boy, this must be some kind of victory, you know, for this fellow. And I found out after the service was over how long his wife had been praying for him. And he said, you know, I heard the preacher say, If he'd sing one more verse, would I come? And I realized without him, I didn't have a hope. I didn't have a prayer. So I came. And friend, it's experiences like that in my own life as a preacher that have given me oftentimes the encouragement to keep on preaching it. Now I can't speak for Paul in all of his mission journeys and all the churches that he had a very vital part in. But here he was suffering in prison because he'd been faithful to do what God called him and equipped him to do. Now he goes on to say in verse 12, verse 14, this is where I want to begin our brief message now, okay? When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. Now this is his prayer. The creator, the father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. Boy, if you don't have a great verse for all these doubters and scoffers and guys that believe in uh, evolution, underline this one. The creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Now he's talking to believers. 
He's already told them they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the first chapter. He's already told them they're saved by grace through faith and not of themselves, that it's a gift from God. He's preparing them, see. And right in the middle of this letter, he said, I get on my knees, I want to pray for you. The one thing that you need most, the one thing we need most tonight, friend, now I'm going to say it everywhere I know how, I've tried in the last few weeks, till you get it, okay? All you listening overseas, till you get it. Listen to this. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Do you have that strength tonight? Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Now Philip translates that way. He'll be more and more at home in your heart. In other words, he's not going to just have the living room and the family room, but he's going to go into every bedroom and every closet, so to speak, you know. All those places where you're hiding stuff. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I've done it. I've had to go through, oh, you bet, since I've been a preacher, man. I've had to get rid of some stuff. I hope, boy, the Lord, you, let me ask you this. If the Lord came in and opened your refrigerator tonight, would you be embarrassed? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see some guilty ones out there. If you have, if you're not tonight, you have been in the past. Amen. Amen. Come on now, let's fess up. You know, I said if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, whatever that is. Sins of omission, sins of commission, things we shouldn't have done that we did, things we should have done we didn't do. Are your sins confessed up to date tonight? See, Paul is concerned here as he prays that Christ will make his home in the hearts of these to whom he's writing. He said, your roots will go down into God's love and keep you strong. King James says, rooted in him. Rooted in him. You know, whatever a plant is rooted on, or rooted in, excuse me, it gets its nourishment from. Rooted and grounded in love. Now I want to give you three thoughts up to this. First of all, we have the endowment. According to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his in the inner man. We need the endowment. But when Christ becomes more and more at home in our heart, he takes the throne. We have the enthronement of Jesus Christ. Now let's go on to see what point number four is. Verse 18, and may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. 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 They don't. He knows that. We know that. We know there was a time when we didn't know as much about the Christian life as we do now. I hope. Amen? Amen. Now think with me. That's the enlightenment. We have the endowment. We need an endowment. We experience the enthronement and God turns on the light and says, okay, now I'm going to show you. I'm going to reveal it. See, Paul knew this, that the revelation he had experienced in, preparing, in God preparing him to preach and to write this letter, that it was from God. You know, I get a lot of understanding about the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the New Testament writer, the Apostle Paul when I read this prayer, see? He said, God enlightened me to this mystery that I'm preaching, this mystery of Christianity. He wanted everybody to know. So through this enlightenment, we come to know. Now look, you talked about your pastor taking these verses, Russ, and, and digging them out every Sunday in your church. Look at this. Then Christ will make it, verse, verse 17, 
will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. See, as you trust in him by faith. Here it is. See, as your faith is, so shall it be unto you. You know that verse? You remember the centurion that came to Jesus and said, my, my son is sick. If you come to my house, he believed the Lord could do it. See, he believed. James has a word to say about if you, if you lack, if you're praying and you lack wisdom about a matter. A lady asked Norris and I in the class to pray with her about a very important decision she's facing in, in this next week about where she's going to spend the rest of her life. Pretty important decision. And I thought of the verse, if any man lacks wisdom, and that means women too, any person lacks wisdom, let them ask of God who gives to all freely and doesn't abrade us, doesn't put us down because we have a need. But let us ask in faith, he said. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, like a wave of the sea. For he that wavereth, James went on to say, is like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. Do you know what Paul says in Ephesians? That if the preachers don't go on to preach what God's appointed them and anointed them to preach in the very next chapter, then we won't, what? We won't come to maturity because why? Because we'll be believing every window of doctrine. False teachers are rising. There's a lot of doctrinal winds blowing, my friend. Don't get caught up in it. There's a lot of heresy out there. It sounds good. As Paul said, some are twisting the truth. They're tweaking it just a little bit. See? Don't mess with it, friend. The Bible means what it says. It means what it means. It's from God. It's the word of life. The word of light. The word that brings liberty to our heart. Because we have new life in Jesus. Now, you know, I believe that uh, some of us have failed to understand Paul's prayer here. Then you may have power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is his love. Now, what in the world, why did he say that? Because he loves from the guttermost to the uttermost. Some of the most dynamic believers today, even in Hollywood, if you please, alcoholics, multimillionaires, some have left the Hollywood scene, because they couldn't take it anymore. Bought ranches in Montana and so forth. I guarantee you, I've been there. I preach there. I know what I'm talking about. In Bozeman, Montana. Been there. And you know, we hear these men give their testimonies and, and we say, how in the world, how in the world after all those years and all the money you made, could you just pick up everything and and I've seen a smile on their face. As if to say, brother, if you ever meet Jesus, you'll feel just like I do. We used to say, don't knock it till you've tried it. I love it. I love it. I turned to a preacher one day. He said, well, I don't know about all this stuff. I said, brother, don't knock it till you've tried it. There's more in Christ than most people ever dream. 
Now, what he's saying is, can we love to the limitless love of God? Do we love people like that? Unconditionally? You know what my son wrote me today? My wife heard it. She said, my goodness. I got home and I had a message from Craig, my wayward prodigal, my oldest. He said, I love you, Dad. This is your day. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for all the things you've done for me and taught me. Oh, boy. Well, I texted him back. I said, I guess I didn't teach you as well as I wanted to. I want you to forgive me, son. I always wanted the best for you. But I was too busy too many times to spend the time with you that we needed to spend together. I haven't gotten any answer on that. But I hope it made him think. Well, when I heard the pastor's sermon this morning and went home to that message from my son, I felt more convicted in my heart that if I had understood this passage maybe a little better, if I'd helped him to understand it, to know how much God loved him. You know what Craig said to me today? He said, Dad, you love me at my best and you love me at my worst, but you never stop loving me. I'm not asking for any praise because I don't deserve it. You know, preachers have a hard time spending enough time with their wife and their family. All of us are involved in ministry. Even those overseas and some of those little churches over there that nobody but God could find. And we are able to preach to you guys tonight because of the internet and the miracles of modern technology. We're getting the message. I hope you're getting this message tonight, friend. Paul prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed for us to understand this exceeding enablement that comes from God. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Did you get that verse? 19th verse. Let me read it again. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Many has benediction in his prayer. Now all glory to God who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You know, the devil's beat me up here lately saying, you know, don't expect too much out of Craig. I don't expect, hey, God's working on me. I'm trying to help him, but I'm getting a lot more help to realize some of my own past mistakes, saying, son, please don't wait and have to learn anymore the hard way. You know, hard-headed people have to learn the hard way. And boy, he's one of the most hard-headed ever born, I think. But I love him to death. And if he happens to listen to this sermon, I want him to know that more than anything in this world, if he could just learn that God is able to do infinitely more than we might ask or think, even at his age right now, with all of the baggage he has, and all the times he's turned his back on God and broken God's heart, that God is able, so glorify him, Paul said, in the church and Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. We have the endowment. We need the endowment of power. Jesus told them in the upper room, I mean, to told them before, when they went to the upper room, they remembered his word. Terry, till you be endued with power from on high. Don't go out and try to preach the gospel without the power. You need the enablement. If you don't love people like Jesus, you'll never be able to reach people like Jesus did. If you don't love the kind of people 
that Jesus spent most of his time with, you'll never make it in ministry. And I'll tell any preacher that. I'll tell any missionary that. I'll tell anyone who's considering surrendering their heart and life to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think it's fun and games, brother, I've got news for you. You're looking at a guy who started out when he was 15, who's now 87, who's the first one to tell you, without him, we can't do one thing to please him, to honor him, to glorify him like he wants us to do it. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Terry, till you be endued with power from on high. And they came there and stayed there and they prayed there. And they came together till they got together. And then they went out together, G-A-T-H-E-R. And 3,000 were saved in a single day. Do you think they would have had a victory like that without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit upon them? That's the power that's available to every one of us if we'll pay the price. Pay the price to possess the power to preach the preaching and to produce the product that God wants to produce, the fruit he wants to produce through you and through me. That's his prayer for us. You understand now why I said this is the prayer? And I remember that Sunday when I preached that and a professor from Mobile College came up to me. He was interim pastor at Oakdale Baptist Church. And he gave me a big hug. He said, you're preaching to me today, Kerry. I said, I'm just preaching to anybody who needs it. That's the way I feel tonight. Let's pray together. Father, like Paul, I pray that all of us who understand our endowment, that we're children of God, we have the richest endowment, the richest, oh Lord, what a heritage is ours. To be heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. An equal heir with Jesus. How could we ever doubt your love, Father? That limitless love. And its height and depth and width and breadth. Lord, we want to be able, through your enablement, the exceeding abundantly above all. We want to be able, Lord, as you enable us. And we pray for that tonight, for all of our friends, for all those who are listening, who may not even know Jesus in their own heart, who may not have his presence because they've never allowed him to come into their heart. Oh, Lord, I pray that they'll open the door as he sweetly and softly, sincerely knocks at the door of their heart tonight. May they receive him right where they are, even as they listen. May they bow their head, head and say, Lord Jesus, more than anything in this world, I want to be a Christian. I turn from my sin and sinning and turn to Jesus, and I want to be saved and be what he wants me to be and live for him and serve him with what's left of my life. Oh, God, grant it tonight because we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Come lead us, Rob. By the way, this is not only my favorite passage, but it's my favorite invitation. You know why? This is softly and tenderly. He's not saying, hey, you idiot, hard-headed rascal. Why won't you open the door? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Is Even in the words of that hymn, I can't tell you how many people I've seen saved when we were singing that invitation. I hope that'll be true tonight. I hope people, everyone listening tonight is not a Christian, everyone viewing the message and the ministry on YouTube, if you've never trusted Jesus for the cleansing power, oh, you gotta have that first. And then the power to conform to the image of his son will be yours when you put your faith in it. 
leaders. This is on 312, softly and tenderly. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you. continue to pray, but most of all, most of all, you can have a lot more power in prayer than you have tonight. I can have a lot more power in prayer, not just in preaching and teaching and witnessing and sharing with the lost and dying world, but friends, I heard a great preacher say many years ago, I can listen to a man pray to see what he's praying about and tell you where he is spiritually. I can tell you where he is spiritually in his walk with Christ by what he's praying for. Now, if he's praying for things and stuff and blessings, you know, there are a lot of preachers you can listen to that'll, you know, tell you God wants to bless you and make you rich and whatever, healthy and wealthy and wise. But friend, let me tell you something. The greatest thing God can do for anybody is to bring them into his fullness. Because the more of his fullness we share here, 
and more of his glory we're going to share and appreciate over there. Amen? Amen. Oh, him it says, I'll soon be at home over there. I heard my grandparents sing it. When I was a guy, you know, like this. I'll soon be at home over there. And another person Oh, think of the friends over there, over there. Some of you have friends that'll be over there. But a lot of us even have friends on Facebook. They're not going to be over there if something doesn't happen in their life to bring them to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray for them. Let's pray earnestly. Pray in faith, believing. Jesus said, as your faith is, so shall it be unto you. All things that you desire, he said, when you pray, believe that you shall receive them, and you shall receive them. Because he knows we're not to pray for anything. It doesn't honor him anyway. Hey, I love you all for coming tonight. I know it's a holiday. We missed a lot of folks. Our penis is at another place. Our our solos is at another place tonight. They all ask for permission. I said, if the Lord leads you, you go wherever he leads you. We're going to share. Amen? Amen. And we're so glad Esai's here. She's the sweetest Christian. I'll tell you what, I just learn to love her more every day. If you don't know her, you get to know her. You tell her how much you love and appreciate her faithfulness. I'll tell you what, buddy, she hadn't missed one or two Sunday nights since she started coming. Right. She really hasn't. And you know, I kind of thank you for becoming a fan, too. I'm a fan. Amen. I'm a fanatic. And he's got a family home waiting for him tonight to celebrate Father's Day with him. A, a former, I mean, a future son-in-law. I got a future son-in-law. I got a son-in-law. I've got uh, two of my daughters and a bunch of grandkids. I don't know. I think three of them are there. And they're expecting Grandpa to feed them, huh? And I think four dogs. Four dogs. Four dogs. And I'm under orders. Yeah, to get get on quick. I'm under orders. No dinner tonight, guys. I'm under orders. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're all under orders. That's the whole point. Amen. Amen. The only one guy I'm out to please, and that's Jesus. Amen. Because I'm going to meet him maybe sooner than I would like to, but I'm, I, want, I want to be ready. All right, y'all get out of here. Now. Go. Come back next Sunday. Bring somebody with you. Glad to have you. Y'all welcome this good-looking couple over here on my left, okay? not be great in numbers, but we're mighty. <laughs>